I want to welcome everybody to another one of our podcasts here at the Clearwater Historical Society Museum. We are truly blessed today to be joined by Bob Ress of Ress Marine Construction and really the, the kind of the godfather of uh, the waterfront here in Pinellas County and the whole state, uh, Wally Erickson. Um, we're going to go into their from, from how they started in Clearwater, what they found uh, in Clearwater, what their contribution to Clearwater in particular and the area in general, uh, starting with their, their move to Clearwater or their birth uh, in this area. And uh, so let's, uh, let's go ahead and get started. We have uh, Bob Ress on the, on the right here and Wally Erickson on the left. So welcome and thanks for joining us. Uh, guys, uh, if you want to uh, work together or take it one at a time, I'm going to take us back to page one of uh, your history in Clearwater. Well, I originally came from Indian Rocks, went to Anona School, and then uh, I came to Clearwater. I went to this uh, South Ward School in second grade. My teacher was Miss Brady, and I went all through South Ward, and then uh, junior high school, and senior high, and then the University of Florida. Okay. And... Uh, then tell us, how, how did you end up in the marine construction business? Did you know you wanted to do that when you were a little kid, or how'd that happen? No, uh, it sort of, my father was in it. He got in it by accident. He had a, a wood treating company in Dunedin that he treated with Cooper and all, uh, and he couldn't sell his wood. So he got into the marine construction business to sell, you know, pressure treated lumber for wooden docks. Used it himself. Yes, and he got, got ill. He died when he was 50. And uh, I didn't like working in an engineering firm. I was always outside all my life. So I went to, uh, I took over the business after I got out of college. But he was sick while I was in school. Mm -hmm. And business went to nothing. Uh, I had to sort of start over again. Mm -hmm. So that's how I got into it, and uh, I had uh, I had a lot of fun in it. I met a lot of good people. And, uh, it, just, it was good business. And it's still a very uh, very viable business, as your son Skip is now the third generation of Rest Marine Construction locally. Yes, it is carrying on the tradition with the uh, quality, and uh, is is still the the go-to guy. I know when uh, when I had a, a dock built with a lift. Uh, I, I didn't bother poking around. I knew right where I was going. So, uh, and then uh, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, once you were in in that business, uh, kind of walk it over into your association with our other guest today, Wally Erickson. How'd you cross paths with Wally? Yeah, well, uh, Wally just lived down the street from me when after we moved out of Clearwater and went to Arizona. He was just a little. You know, a couple blocks south of me, and I guess that's where I met him. I don't really, I don't really remember uh, the exact day. And I always admired Wally. He was always the kind of guy that could get anything done. He had a dredge, and, uh, a, uh, a wooden boat that he built, possibly built it with his father. I'm not sure. And uh, uh, that was a great boat. And uh, I just sort of kept up with him years. I never really worked for him at any time, or he worked for me. But I knew him, and uh, about everybody around knew him in this, this area. So you had kind of parallel lives. Yeah, he was always he was always in the marine construction business. I think what he liked to do most is something with fishing, but he got into the dredging business and he did some marine construction. And uh, I think his heart was really in the fishing uh, industry. Well, Wally, uh, tell us uh, tell us your story from uh, from when you first became a resident of the area. Well, we moved from Tampa here in 1935. We moved to Dan Eden. I never lived in Clearwater until recently. Now I live in the Hamptons. But. Uh, we lived on the water. My dad, when we moved over here, he got in the bird rack business, building bird racks, collecting iguana. He had bird racks from close to 
is run with northwest Clearwater Beach at about a quarter mile. And from there up, you didn't get north of Cedar Keys with his bird But there was quite a business in the bird riding business. And then when World War II came, and the U Air Force used the target, the uh, bird racks were targets, <laughs> shot them all up and tore them down and so forth. Uh, he got into sponging. And uh, so then, of course, I was a kid in those days. And but I started working on a sponge boat when I was nine years old and got a quarter of a share. And share is what a man got. Mm -hmm. I couldn't remember. When I was 10, they gave me a half a share because I did much better. When I was 11, I got a full share because I wouldn't let a man beat me on production. So they said, well, if you're going to produce as much as a man, it's not fair just to pay you. So anyway, and then I, uh, he did a little micro fishing, and so I was like to see those fish with the pretty yellow spots, you know. And, and I got in the fishing business. And I produced as much as a million pounds in four months there, and did it for seventy some years, I guess. And got millions and millions of pounds of micro. Now, where did you transition from commercial fishing to in the uh, marine construction and the dredging business? Well, because of the fishing season, the lack of the king fishing is seasonal. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to fish when the, they were here, of course. That's when I'd fish. And then I'd go uh, build a boat or get in the dredging or towing. Or I towed. One ship is all I towed. But I towed many of barges from the East Coast to Tampa and Tampa to Louisiana. Louisiana Tampa. Now you've got a couple stories about uh, some of your first or your, your most notable dredging ventures. Uh, I think everybody's familiar with Island Estates. Uh, we're talking to the guy that started Island Estates. Uh, you dredged up the initial uh, initial part of Island Estates, correct? Well, I was one of the first, there was another dredge working there. But uh, I put that finger in there, the land parallel to Memorial Causeway that had the big seafood restaurant built on it, the ceasefire restaurant, the marina down at the end. That's Windward Passage. Right. I did that for, was we working for Wallace Skinner and Harry Armstrong, and they were the ones that were having that finger in. And approximately what year was that? I think it was 57. Okay. And uh, then in 60, they put a moratorium on private dredging in the state of Florida. Put us out of business, so I went to work. And I wound up working for Gahagan dredging out of New York, which is one of the big dredging outfits in the world, that dredges ever were. And we wound up dredging in our coastal waterway from Tarbonne Springs to St. Petersburg. And that was uh, six, in the early 60s, correct? Right. right. Okay, so there you go. The ICW, Intercoastal Waterway, which goes from the Canyon border all the way around Florida around to the Tex-Mex border the local channel here again from Tarpon Springs so basically the length of Pinellas County you are talking to the gentleman who was responsible for that dredging so if you've ever run aground out there uh, that's Wally Erickson and uh, <laughs> You're not a ground, you weren't in the channel. That's right. That's right. Neat stories. Now, I understand there's something else uh, in the state of Florida that you were involved with the dredging of. Something notable, while it's not Clearwater history, um, certainly as a Clearwater resident, you helped shape history. Uh, tell us about your connection to the state space program. Well, 
Well, after we finished Santa Costa, I went back fishing, then I got a call to come over to the Cape there when they talked to me. So I went over and the superintendent that was in charge of the southern United States, because Skagen was one of the big outfits in the world. He uh, wanted me to come over to the Cape and talk to him. He said, went over. He said, uh, they have some plans out on the table, and he says, do you think this can be done with a hydraulic dredge? And I said, I think it can. He said, are you sure now? He said, because the Corps don't think it can be, or Army engineers don't think it can be done with a hydraulic dredge. And our engineers in New York don't think it can be done. What do you think? I said, yeah, I think so. He said, next question. If we take the job, would you go as superintendent on it? I said, I gotta talk to my wife. He says, you got 15 minutes, she's out in the car. So I went out. She said, well, uh, Michael season's about over with. So, and you like challenges, so why don't you take it? So I took it. And uh, we got the general job done way ahead of time and didn't have any problem with it. We put in totally in that area because we put a causeway in called Master Causeway. It did 26 million yards of fill there on the coast. And uh, yeah, they had a job digging part of the inner coast from north, north of Palm Beach. And so when they wanted to go down there, I told them when we finished that job, I was going to quit and come back home. We got the job done. The Corps gave us 100 days to do the job. The company officials said you ought to get it done in about 80 days. And J.T. Wheelers told me, he said, well, the day before you finish calls, because I got to get the Corps down there and the Coast Guard down there, because we're digging the intercoastal and filling up where the island was washed away partly by the, a hurricane. So, on the ninth day, I called him. Eighth day, actually, I called him and I said, you better come down here tomorrow. We're going to have this job finished here. He said, impossible. I said, I don't care whether it's impossible or not. I'm telling you, it's everything up to great stakes on the island. And the channel's done. And uh, he said, I said, I said it's about noon tomorrow. I'm going to shut this thing down get on the boat and go home. He said, I'm going to call the crew boat owner and tell him that I'll take you ashore. I said, you forget I own the crew boat and I'll pay the captain. <laughs> so he said, you're serious, aren't you? I said, yes. So he, they came down and about noon that day, they said, well, you got it to great stakes everywhere and the channel's deep all the way, so I guess we can shut the dredge down and well, the job finished, and that was nine days. We got that on a big flat contract. Wow. Now, what, uh, which launching pad was it? That, 39A. Uh, 39A, which is still in use today. Right. Well, not still today. Currently still in use. Fascinating times, fascinating stories. Um, and, again, the connection to Clearwater is the, the again, you heard it uh, with the macro fishing, and you heard uh, Captain Kai Lewis talk about, uh, some of his uh, working straight through for some 40-day season twice a year during the uh, mackerel and kingfish migration from north to south and south to north, and uh, likewise here with uh, Wally Erickson. And uh, let, let's connect a little bit. Uh, we've got a, a podcast also with Courtney Ross. In fact, Bill Graham's going to join us uh, later for an additional podcast. Um, you guys collectively threw in um, with, with a lot of the docks and piers and marine ways and so forth. Contrast in particular Clearwater, but just in general, how the waterfront has changed from when, uh, when you were young. And Bob, I know you spent a lot of time as a young man, a young boy, around Donald Roblin and some of his uh, exploits and uh, hung around his place. In fact, um, uh, Captain Dave Spaulding, uh, his outboard engine was originally yours, I understand? Yeah, it was a 
one and a quarter horsepower Elgin that my father bought me from uh, Sears and Roebuck. <clears throat> and I was probably maybe seven or eight years old. We, at that time, we lived in Indian Rocks. And, uh, my father gave me a lot of leeway. And Indian Rocks was kind of a bad place for an outboard motor. If you got out of the channel, you, when you hit bottom, you, most of the time you hit a rock. Does this look familiar? Yeah, that's not mine. That's another one. But uh, David, I got rid of his. They got rid of the one that was mine, and we found that at some place and bought it. So, but that's the same engine, air cooled engine. Yeah. It was 19 pounds. <laughs> well, tell us some of the memories that uh, that this this little engine and your first boat, and as a kid, playing around in the waters here in Clearwater. Yeah, I had a little eight-foot uh, Cypress skiff. That was my first boat. And uh, as I said, we lived in Indian Rocks. And, uh, my father would give me a parameter how far I could go. And he was, uh, he was good about what he told me to do because he'd tell me why. He'd say, you know, if something happens to you, you know, you run out, you motor quits, you run out of gas, anything, I'll know where to look. That made sense to me, even at a young age. Mm -hmm. So I ran all around Indian Rocks, all in behind those mangrove islands. I got to know that pretty good. And, uh, I did run aground with it. I did okay with it. Of course, the boat didn't draw any water. It was very shoal draft. And, uh, and I was very careful. I always had a little, he always had me have a stick with me and a bucket in case we got water in the boat. <laughs> so today, you know, if I would go out in a small boat, I'd make sure I had some way to bow. Mm -hmm. And uh, speaking of boats, um, you, you've still got a couple, don't you? Yeah. Yep. They've all been built by Clark Mills. Okay. And uh, he built boats at the, uh, what was at the time, Clearwater Bay Marineways. So Brumby's yard, and um, as I recall, you guys had some uh, involvement in in uh, building that uh, that facility down there. Yeah, we did all the marine construction work there, built the sheds. And, uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, that was a, that place had a hard bottom in it, and uh, we had a, no way to get the piling in it. Marjor Marine, a much larger contractor than us, had punched everything, and. Uh, I didn't have the big enough equipment to do that, so I, I shot, I punched a small hole and then loaded it with dynamite and sprung, they, they called it springing the hole, and I, I could spring it out and put a piling in it, that's what that one was, and then uh, I put about 500 piling in in Crystal River with Peach Pier the same way, mm -hmm. and then the environmentalists and people got upset with us killing fish and whatnot. I thought we were going to get in trouble in Crystal River. I went there to get a permit to put these piling in, and the, <laughs> it was the Marine Patrol at the time. And the guy laughed at me and said, I can't give you a permit to do that. So, but you go ahead and do what you're doing. We'll send a man down there from time to time, and if you're doing something to the environment, we'll just have to stop you. Well, that kind of made sense to me. And uh, we, did, we didn't kill very many fish. We killed a few eels once we to the surface and a few small fish and uh, all of a sudden one of the fellows from the Marine Patrol came down and we sh shot a whole line of pilot. We, we didn't do it one at a time. We shoot a whole line and then we put the pilot in and we, uh, we killed a bunch of fish. Well, I'm done with this job. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the guy was over there. He was a reasonable man and he started counting the birds and so forth and and they said, that bird that's eating those fish is almost extinct. He said, if those birds are eating those fish, you can kill as many as you want. <laughs> <laughs> Never expected a government agent to tell me, <laughs> to tell me anything like that. But that's, that's changed now. And, uh, so later on, I, uh, we, we did get, uh, we couldn't afford the insurance and so forth to do any blasting. And they started wanting us to put seismographs up all around way too 
way too expensive to do that. So I got into the, I built a drill, uh, oil field type drill, used tricone rock bits, and I built, I guess, thousands of holes with that. You drilled for other contractors as well. You had the only drill. I was only the only one with a drill. Only Even Miser didn't have a drill. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he got one later on, but yeah. he didn't, at that time he didn't have I Again. think I was the first drilling company. Again, some of the innovation from a couple of Clearwater residents. Uh, speaking of uh, creating things and innovative, um, Wally, didn't you invent something? Well, I've had a patent in 22 nations, so I'm an Erickson safety problem until a Canadian outfit got in and ruined it. And the U.S. Patent Department, I thought they would protect me, but they said, told me right out, they said, if you were a public corporation, we'd go after him, but a private man, we're not interested in that. I said, well, I paid you $14,000 for that permit. Well, I don't matter, you're private, so we're not interested. So they would back it up. Then the, in Canada, I found out, I had to go through the Royal Mounted Police up there, and I thought they were going to do something. They talked like they would, but they didn't. Gave up on that. And I don't know if you've ever opened these base scallops, calico scallops. Uh, I built a machine to open them because we needed one. I was scalloping and we're loading them on the trucks, hauling them to the East Coast where I thought I had a machine over there, the Cape. And we were catching them in a what? He went all the way to Apalachicola and basically 25 of them and so forth. And we catch all the west of here. We're catching uh, up to uh, 60 bushels every three minutes offshore. So it had to be thick, thick, thick. And, uh, so I built a machine to put on board my boat and I built a 115 foot boat at that time. So I put it on there and built it about the time I got it to where it was uh, working good. I thought the scallops died off from Key West all the way to Appalachia within a week or so. They lived their life cycle and died. And you don't have them every year, so I took it off. And Set it on the bank in Red Lobster's place in Bayborough Harbor in St. Pete. And they wound up selling it to the Brazilians. And I told them, I said, I thought it would do 100 gallons of finished scallops an hour. And after the Brazilians got it set up, they wanted me to come down and see if I couldn't get it doing more. And they wouldn't tell me what it was doing, I couldn't find out that I come down. So I went down and I found out it was doing 600 gallons of finished scallops an hour and there wanted more. So I wouldn't touch it. I stayed there 10 days. And uh, I told him build another one just like it or build a bigger one, but I wasn't touching it because I told them 100 gallons and they were getting 600. They worked a 10 hour day and have 6,000 gallons of scallops. Scallops, so. That's just amazing, and, and the uh, Erickson safety pump, um, that's uh, that's probably saved a lot of boats from... Uh, well, the only one I know that I uh, heard about it, it really saved it was an uh, Icelandic boat on a private uh, Iceland. They went out in the wintertime fishing, and, and the boats started taking over water, and then, Average pump would clog on most anything. Well, it was taking a lot of water, and the fish were coming out of the fish hole and so forth. And uh, that pump would pump them overboard, pump everything, pieces of rope, towels, or anything he'd pump over, not a clog. If, uh, and it had no bearings, no nothing to wear out, so it would last forever unless you. 
something in it, jam a piece of steel or something. And that was a drive shaft driven pump that spun whenever the engine was when running. The engine was in gear and pump. And didn't wasn't that also used on the uh, on the ducks? Uh, no, that was a different deal. Okay. Together. Okay. I know they had something something similar. And uh, you also have a connection to I think everybody in the area remembers the Rock House in Dunedin. Right. Do you know who lived there originally? Yeah, we did. We built it. <laughs> My dad built it in nineteen thirty nine. And uh, we lived there for several years and then sold it to Ben Skinner. He bought it. And then later on Weaver got it. They named the place Weaver Park where the house was. And the original house that we built there in thirty nine was uh built out of rocks out of the bottom of the Ancloke River when they dredged it. 35. He took the barge and went up, and that barge and loaded it, and there was a single arch bridge over the creek there, which was called Brickyard Creek, and he went under the bridge up alongside the house, used the rocks to build a house. Now that's and all been, course, I'm sorry, go ahead. And of course, I uh, did a lot of boat building. Boats up to 115 feet and 80 footers and 55 footers. And then only built one a 70 footer for other people, the John Palmer. But the other boats I'd take and use, I'd, uh, when I'd scallop in, I'd work in the Gulf area, then I'd go sea scalloping as far up as Nova Scotia. And Come back out and look at St. Petersburg, Red Lobster. Then I was tramping and I tramped as far south as the Nicaraguan border all over the Gulf. And, and uh, of course, I, before I did a lot of that, there was a group of fishing and snapper fishing. And so I did an awful lot of fishing, but then I did most of the dredging that was done between Clearwater and Newport Ritchie. First time in Newport Ritchie Channel was ever dredged. I dredged it basically by myself. And uh, it's uh, 15,000 feet long. And, and before I dredged it, it did a spring tide in the northeaster. It was dry for a quarter of a mile offshore and more totally dry. It's only four foot depth, but 50 foot bottom width, so they could get in the house most any time now. Yeah. So your your connection to the waterfront really spans the globe. Um, uh, maybe I missed it. Did you mention you had also done some commercial crabbing up in the Pacific Northwest? No, but I got a boat that's working. Still, it doesn't belong to me because I sold it. So okay. It and it's it's still in service today. That's right. Okay. It was featured in the magazine National Fisherman in uh, 2003, and it was working out of Eureka, California, at that time. Okay. And then in 2011, it was featured again, and it was like, just like new. So. Yeah. I understand three years ago or four years ago it was working out of Seattle now. And How many boats have you had over the years? You, can you count that high? <laughs> <laughs> Pushing a hundred, I guess. Pushing a hundred. Uh, I built thirty three from all the boats and eyes, skips up to hundred and fifteen feet. Well, I'm speaking of mullet skiffs, I'm sure you've seen the one that we have out there on display. So uh, uh, we'll, uh, we'll show you that out front. So okay. we had got that with the help of uh, uh, Zach Lewis, Captain Kai Lewis's son. Um, Bob, how many boats have you had over the years, counting the first little uh, the first little wooden boat at, as, a, well, as a young man? I think Clarkie built me about 15 boats, including a pram that I still have. And, uh, and I had probably, I had at 
12 foot skiff that my father built, plywood skiff, and that first boat that I had, it was an eight foot Cypress plank boat, heavy thing. And plywood's much better. That Cypress absorbs water like a sponge. And uh, kids, you know, they get up, go aground up on, pull a boat up on shore and, and hog island and tide goes out and a terrible time getting it back in yeah. the water. So I guess I've, I've had probably 17 or 18 bucks in my lifetime. Now, how many do you currently have, not counting the one that's uh, still on display up at uh, Woodwright, which uh, was, was Clark Mill's shop? I got a, I got a barge and I got a, that he built, and I have a tugboat, a Clark Mill's tugboat. And uh, I've got a 12-foot uh, sailing skiff. That's what I had. Of course, that pram that you just mentioned. Is that sailing skiff up at Woodwright as well? No. Okay. I know they've got one hanging from the ceiling that you can see from uh, from Broadway. Yeah. But that's not that's not a pram. That, uh, that, that is one. a pram. No, but the one that you see from Broadway looking up. Oh, no. It's more of a catboat type. Yeah. Uh, it's in my son-in-law's garage. Okay. Uh, it's got a Yep, definitely, uh, definitely a piece of a piece of history to be uh, certainly to be preserved, which is, again is what we're all about here at the Clearwater Historical Society. Uh, to be able to have interviews like this and uh, reminisce with, you know, the, the the old saying, "I know a guy who knows a guy who knows a guy." We're talking to the guy, both of them here. Um, you know, again, the, you, you're you're talking to the gentleman that. Uh, dynamited his way through rock bottom here in Clearwater to have some of the places that we all take for granted now. Uh, everybody's been over to the beach and uh, driven out island to island states or certainly at least driven past it and uh, he was responsible for the finger that houses Island Yacht Harbor at the end. Uh, used to be high and dry marina, it's now condominiums and uh, Clearwater Marine Aquarium and Island Way Grill, which used to be Ross Yacht Service and Midway Boatel. A um, lot, lot of history here in Clearwater, a lot of waterfront water history. Um, what uh, what else would you guys like to share about your growing up in Clearwater? What are, about your car uh, warranty there? Well, and I have something in common. Uh, I guess we got more than one thing in common. Um, we never took our education, we're both educated, and we never took our education too seriously. When something needed to be done and, it, and everybody said it couldn't be done, we got it done, <laughs> one way or the other. And, uh, probably more in Wally's case than mine, but uh, what I like to do is I like to get a piece of equipment or something and, and build it and then use it. That was my fun. Uh, speaking of that, your your barge is a rather unique propulsion system, doesn't it? No, it's a standard uh, uh, propulsion system, a 671 driving a conventional propeller. Okay. I did have a barge years ago that had a, a system on it. It was made during the war in the early 40s called a Murray and Trigurtha. It was like a modern inboard outboard except to set on the deck of a barge. Our, that's the one I remember because everything today is either a shaft drive inboard or they're hanging outboards on the back of the small barges. Uh, I recall seeing that it was a, a, a rather unique uh, design and, and the only one the only one I had seen like that and and again like you said you came up with a, you had a problem and you came up with a solution and then made it work. Uh, I remember seeing that one look like a look like a big outboard the stern drive hanging off the back of the barge. Yeah, yeah I bought that um, from uh, Dick Meisner. Uh, he had it on a pretty good sized barge. It didn't have much power. It had a little four-cylinder Willys cheap engine on it, 
when I got it. I put a, a 353 Detroit diesel on it, but I had to modify the whole thing to do that. It wasn't wide enough for that engine. And uh, that, uh, that made it you know, much better. And barges, in the marine construction business, you have to get in shallow water. Just a conventional uh, propeller system, unless it was in a tunnel. It just wasn't very uh, adaptable for that. And uh, that worked very well. I mean, I could crank the unit up. In fact, I, I could crank it all the way up. Uh, so it was vertical. Uh, I don't know why they built it that way, but they did. I guess maybe they didn't, didn't want it hanging over the back, sticking out. We hardly ever did any, it pulled it up that high unless we wanted to do something to the prop. Yeah. But, uh, it was a good unit. Was, uh, very good unit. Now your tugboat, um, Clark Mills built that, correct? Yes. Approximately when? 1972. Okay. And uh, when did he stop building boats? Yeah, I don't know the year. He had a heart attack, and uh, that pretty well stopped him mm -hmm. building the boats. He did finish up uh, uh, sailing. Well, he did finish the boat, but he got all the frames built and the stem and the transom. And then he sold it to uh, a fellow, or maybe he gave it to him. Sarasota, and uh, I don't know if he ever finished it or not. It was a long time ago. But, uh, he built the original Double Eagle. Yeah, that was an interesting thing when he did that. Um, Bill Gilmore, who was a very good friend of mine, I said, most of the way around the world with him later, later on, he was uh, Donald Grobling's son and <clears throat> stepson. That's, that's how I got involved with, uh, with him, with uh, Bill. If we used to sneak into the Rumbling Estate all the way from Magnolia. We could scale the wall, and then it was a walkway all the way down there. We could go all the way to, to Rumbling, which was the last uh, estate on uh, Druid Road. And we was always a afraid of getting caught by Mr. Roper. We did it a few <laughs> times, too. <laughs> yeah, but he, he was a, he'll always be Mr. Roper to me. He was a real gentleman. And, uh, he, uh, I guess I must have been around 10 years old. Uh, at that time, I was, he knew me and I knew him. And, and, uh, we'd go down there and I'd watch him fool around with that alligator, uh, 700 orange. And one day, he uh, came up to me and he said, Bobby, he said, the, the heart attack is not running very well. Uh, would you take it down to Clarkie's and have him uh, look it over and see if he can find out what's wrong with it? Well, I'd never run an inboard, but I've watched uh, the people at uh, Robley's uh, place. Uh, go out in the boat. He had two boats down there. He had one called the Plane 11, a big boat. And then he had this, uh, this sort of an ugly looking boat, I thought. Now that was in that boathouse that's behind his right estate, behind right? 700 iron, right? Right. Now, there. that was, um, how did, uh, that was pretty shallow in there. Um, it wasn't at that time. Oh, and, and, and why not? Did someone dredge a channel there? Yeah, did somebody dredge a channel? <laughs> and it, I don't know who it was. The channel was there when I... Wally, do you have any idea who that was? Oh, not that channel going in there. The channel going into the Roebling property? Oh, yes. Yeah, well, all the way to the end of the that back in, he, But he was just cleaning it out. I don't know who did it. He did that in the 30s. And I'm going to say 36 or something like that. Well, there you go. The reason you didn't run around getting out of there that day was because of Wally's dad. Yeah, well, it, that was the only channel really going in there. Uh -huh. There was another one that went in that wasn't as deep, and it was at Harbor Road Stock mm -hmm. at the uh, uh, end of Magnolia. And, that was, and then they had another dock at another Road Turner Street dock. Mm -hmm. That one, uh, it was not real deep, but it was, it was, you could get in there with a larger boat. The yeah. rest of it was flat. So yeah, the mail barge flat. originally came in at the foot of Turner Street. I'm not familiar yeah, with Yeah, that's that. the first post office was uh, the foot of Turner Street. And uh, I think uh, the first postmaster, I believe, was 
was a Mr. Turner, which is why it was named Turner Street, and the post office was down there, because all the mail came by boat up and down the coast, even before there was a railroad serving the area. Yeah, well, I'm not aware of that. But uh, getting back to the hardtack, which was that little boat, I don't know how long it was, I don't think it was much more than 20 feet long. It was an inboard. And, uh, so, boy, I, I was glad he was going to let me take that boat out by myself, you know, and I'm pretty young. And, uh, so I carefully let it down. It was hoisted up with a, uh, right in front of the Plane 11 boat. I let it down, rolled the cables back up, checked the oil, checked the fuel. I did everything I watched these, you know, the people that mm -hmm. worked for him do. Then I went, uh, I warmed up the engine and went right down. I didn't go anywhere else. I went right down to Clearwater Bay Marine Ways. They had a mechanic there. His name was Selwyn Fuller. I think he was probably a pretty good mechanic. And he took the engine box off and fooled around with it for a little while. I was looking at the other boats. And he called me over and said, I think it's okay now. And so I brought it right back. I washed the boat off and hung it up and everything. Later on, I, I figured out that there wasn't anything wrong with that boat. Uh, Mr. Roebling had a bunch of mechanics. He built that alligator. Anything that he needed done. And he built boats. He built a boat there, too. Mm -hmm. He just wanted me to use that boat because he knew I wanted it, <laughs> but he wouldn't tell me, you know. And, uh, so uh, he got me on that one. Yeah, and your your connection to Mr. Roebling to this day persists as your shop in Bel Air. Uh, wasn't that uh, formally uh, involved with the Roebling? Yes, when he moved from 700 Orange to, to 101 Bayview in Bel Air, uh, he uh, bought that shop. It was uh, it was actually a hangar up in Skycrest area from somebody who was uh, had a, a nursery there and made uh, had flowers and uh, other things. He had two aircraft in there, and he moved the, he moved the nursery to Fort Myers and. Uh, and Donald Roebling bought that shop and took it apart and uh, brought it down here and built it and put it up in Bel Air. And, uh, so it's kind of like an erector set. It, it can be taken apart, and it was taken apart. And there was a, a, a gentleman that worked for uh, a Mr. Roebling. And he'd come in there and sit in the middle of that shop, you know, and look around and said, I've had my hand on every bolt and every piece of steel in here. He was one of the ones that moved it. And, uh, so that was, and I, uh, although most people think that the alligator was built in that shop, it's, that's not true. It was built down at 700 Orange. And he, uh, the equipment in that shop was the equipment that built a prototype of it. I still have the equipment. I have most of it. At some point, he gave uh, a couple of milling machines and maybe a couple of lathes and I don't know what else to a trade school in Miami. And they called up uh, Mrs. Roebling and said that they were finished with it. This was not uh, maybe 20 years ago. I wanted to know what to do with the equipment here. And uh, she asked me, you know, what? yeah, let's get that equipment. I'll do whatever you need to do to, you know, make the arrangements, and I'll figure out a way to get it up there. Well, she turned it over to Warren Cottrell, and he did nothing about it, so nothing happened. I didn't get the equipment back. It was probably worn out by then anyway. I wanted it to happen. So I didn't get that equipment, but I still have a most of the equipment that he built that prototype with. And I had I had a lot of spare parts for that, uh, the leftover parts for that alligator. And the Marine Corps called me out and they wanted to uh, know if I had any parts that they could put in a, some kind of museum or something someplace. And foolishly, I, I gave them all to them that were there. And I know that nobody knew what they were. Or the history on it. They probably got soldier jump. 
but I've never seen him anywhere. Uh, uh, I shouldn't have done that. I should have kept all my stuff. But I think they have a, a uh, museum in Virginia. That's probably where they should have gone. I could have told them pretty well what, what everything was for. Another mistake I made in life. But, uh, generous man. It's sad that he died, you know, in the middle fifties. He was a good friend of my great grandmother's as well. After he uh, verified that the prototype wouldn't sink, uh, he drove down the bluff and uh, came back up through the mangroves uh, and great gave my great grandmother a ride. Uh, there's a picture of my dad's Sea Scout troop. Uh, my dad's in that picture of uh, Mr. Roebling at the helm out uh, driving around some mangroves here somewhere, which uh, today would get you life in prison. Yeah, uh, probably in the North Bay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, up around, uh, well, we go through Lyon Estates. Yeah. We used to let, he'd take some of the Boy Scouts, and I, every time I knew they were going to test that thing, I'd go down there, you know, and we'd ride it. That, uh, it was crazy. He'd run it over the seawall when he had it at his house, but he's had them over. He had them at Dunedin, he's had them in several different places. And he'd run that thing over the seawall, and it was only about 20 feet long. So when it broke over, it was almost quite straight a, up and down. Quite a drop. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I've got pictures of it uh, going over the seawall, uh, down there at 700 yards. Uh, that thing would go anywhere. There's, uh... it, it had no propeller on it, like uh, the duck. It had, uh, the, uh, it had the tracks on it like a bulldozer, except they had fins on them. Right. And, uh, it was, and that was the propulsion. It wasn't very fast in the water. But it floated. Oh, yeah, it floated. Yeah. That, that was the key. It was um, built out of aluminum. They called it aluminium at the time, and mm -hmm. it wasn't a very good material. The aluminum's gotten much, much better now than it was then. It corroded bad and whatnot. And they were having all these floods in this country. I wrote a letter to the state, and uh, that would have been a perfect vehicle if they made it uh, today out of uh, carbon fiber and use modern hydraulics on it to propel it. It'd be the perfect one. It only weighed 8,000 pounds. You could put two of them on a semi truck, you could drop them out of a C 130 with a parachute. Put it on a smaller trail and pull it with a pickup truck. It was really, uh, and the newer ones, if they made it, would have been much lighter. But the military version weighs 22,000 22, pounds and it'll barely float. It's they're they're bigger too. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, it's bigger. Well, there's I, don't the, I don't know the dimensions. Of, uh, Isn't that uh, the one, like the one that's up at the VFW post 2550 that, across from the stadium in Dunedin? That's a military version. Right. I don't know if there's any of his original ones around anymore. As I say, they were made out of aluminum, and it was very it corroded very badly. But he, he wanted it light, and he wanted it to carry as much payload as he could. And uh, it didn't have a door on it like the, some of the modern landing craft. And, but uh, it, uh, it, was, it was fairly low. So they had that big marine base at Dunedin in mm -hmm. World yeah. War II, and teaching the Marines how to run those alligator tractors. First versions at the beginning of the war, I'd be out there rolling in my boat, and these boys running out. Say, let's get him. I could draw off and leave them. They were slow. <laughs> but out, towards the end of the war, they would run pretty good. I couldn't. They'd go a lot faster than I could row. But they crushed, crushed down nearly every mango tree on Calidisi Island. Anything that they could run over, of course, they did. And and it's all going back. It didn't take all the road back out to the board. It crushed them all that. Story is, there's still a couple of them sunk and in the mud out there at the uh, mouth of uh, Curlew Creek. Um, I guess that's... I'm not aware of that. The Corps of Engineers dredged Curlew Creek as part of that project. And that whole point between Pirates Cove Marina and Michigan, I believe, was the base in, in that area, the yeah. uh, training base. And the story is, there's, there's a couple of them that, you know, long since buried in the muck, 
and I guess when they dredged along the uh, shoreline there uh, some years back, they bumped into, you know, again, something solid, which speculation was, gosh, that could have been one of the old alligators. But, you know, there's, there's a lot of lore and, and myth, uh, you know, sunken pirate ships off of Clearwater, uh, you know, Old, uh, World War II submarines. Yeah, I mean, Egmont, yeah, yeah, I all e e everything except an Elvis sighting and Bigfoot. So, <laughs> well, there was there there was a lot of stories about Mr. Roebling. Uh, one of them that I happen to remember: somebody came into his uh, estate at 700 Arms, and, and uh, supposedly he was up pruning a tree, an uh, oak tree on one of those ladders that they used in the groves that were a tree cut in half and so I had hundreds of them around. Everybody had a grove had those ladders. And uh and they tell, you know, told me that's probably I can I've got a way to make make you a lot of money. And supposedly he said, Well, uh, I have a lot of money. That true. That that was completely untrue. Mr. Robert must have weighed 300 pounds, he, and he had uh, Frank Linklater as a head gardener over there, and about four other fellows. And you know, he didn't have to get up. He wouldn't have got up on that tree mm -hmm. at all. But, you know, just, just false uh, statements and whatnot. But uh, he did have a fellow working for him. It was kind of a a joker named Al Williams, and when uh, Mr. Robley moved out of 700 Orange to Bel Air, anybody that worked for him that he didn't, didn't stay working for him, he set him up in business. He set Al Williams up in a business on Fort Harrison Avenue. Hey, Gordon. Hey. And, uh, he, uh, he was kind of a jokester that Al Williams. He's the one that had put those feet on, on Caledonia Island. He had those big, long feet. <laughs> we ended up with uh, that in the attic. I put him in my mother's house, and then got them out. Are those still around? There's, there's myths. They were. They were. They were at the shop. We had a They moved that uh, uh, auto electric from Fort Harrison to Greenwood, mm -hmm. Martin Luther King, and, uh, and the feet were in there. Are they still around? Well, they were. I don't know what happened to them. Uh, I haven't been in there. It's, the place is closed now. And, uh, somebody probably had them if they knew what they were. A lot of stuff gets thrown away that people don't know what it is. Yeah, and especially those but, uh, uh, those old feet. That's that's a whole whole another conversation. Well, uh, we were just joined by uh, Courtney Ross of Ross Yacht Service and Bill Graham, who was uh, basically uh, Courtney. Wasn't he your right hand man? How many years? Sometimes. <laughs> you worked there 47 years. These two guys were Ross Yacht Service, and they have a lot of connection to our, our two guests today. In fact, we'll be uh, uh, very shortly here. The, we'll uh, be joined uh, and uh, switch podcasts here to a new segment uh, featuring Courtney and Bill. But uh, while we've got the four of you, and kind of in conclusion, um, what uh, now that we've got the the uh, four probably four of the most inter most influential uh, people from the waterfront community. Um, guys, have at it. Well, you said something. I'm talking about the Marine Base. Uh, the Marine Base was between Cedar Creek and Curlew Creek. Okay. It was an airport before World War II, but before they made it a Marine Base. And then it was a Marine Base, and it went back to an airport. And then I cut those canals in it. I thought about the name of Nick Manino bought it. And I cut those canals in there to make more waterfront for it. Okay. So those fingers out at the end of uh, Michigan, once again. Yeah. All, <laughs> all that was originally dredged along the waterfront mm -hmm. back in the boom when they dredged that all the way down to the end of that. You know the two spoil banks they put there all. Kellogg's house. Right. And, uh, <clears throat> but that wreckage there was part of that original dredge. It was there from the time I was a kid until it rusted away, I guess. And, uh, it, to my knowledge, it wasn't any alligator of the rolling alligator type. 
Well, there, there you have it. An, another local myth busted. Uh, it wasn't an alligator. It was an old rusty dredge. What was left to dredge parts? Uh -huh. That's the cool thing about history, being able to actually discuss with someone who lived it instead of coming up with the, uh, the, the stories. Of, but sometimes, the, uh, you know, never let the truth get in the way of a good story. So, uh, well, the, guys, go ahead. It's not likely that uh, one of those alligators, either the military one or the other one, would have sunk there. The water was so shallow, it was mm -hmm. pretty, pretty easy to go aground someplace if you thought it was going to. And it wasn't really, uh, I'm not f that familiar with the military version, but I'm very familiar with uh, the prototype of the, uh, the first one that uh, Roman built. Even as you said, though, the water was so shallow, if it yeah. did sink, just stand up. That's right. Right, but e even if they didn't, even if they failed and sunk and sat. <laughs> well, unless they, ran into, unless they ran into something, there wouldn't be any reason for them to sink. No, but I'm saying even if they did sink, they're sinking in three feet of water and it's seven feet tall. <laughs> you know, you can get your feet wet. So. A lot of the, there's a lot of a lot of stories about Mr. Roebling. It just I don't know who made them up, but um, some of them were pretty good. Uh, they were possible. He wasn't really a joker, but Al Williams was. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a story that I heard, I don't know if it was true or not, it could be. Uh, years ago, the old Buicks, you could take the whole hood off of them. They came up from the side. You could, you could open the hood on the side, mm -hmm. or you could open it from the other side. And uh, you could open both sides and take the hood off. And there was a story that he had a party of some kind and they switched hoods on all these old people. <laughs> I don't know if that's true, true or not. Makes a good story. And, oh, yeah, the stories were pretty good. And, uh, and until someone comes along to disprove it that saw that it didn't happen. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, uh, not too many of us left now. You know, no. knew, knew about that. Well, so how, tell me more, because, again, all you guys represent the waterfront here in Clearwater. Uh, discuss some interactions that you might have had over the years. I know, uh, Courtney, you mentioned when you uh, put in your uh, travel lift and, uh, in the gantry that uh, you needed somebody versed in marine construction. And is that person possibly in this room? Yeah, I think Mr. Ress over there. <laughs> <laughs> he did lots of things when, <clears throat> when we'd get in trouble. Sometimes our alligator mouth would get our tadpole tail in deeper than we need to be. Call Bobby. If that didn't work, you'd get the Rogers Brothers voice to show up. Between them all, they'd get it. Have you read, have you read his, his book? I haven't yet. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, there's, there's an old saying that uh, there's three kinds of people. They make things happen, they watch things happen, and they wonder what happened. And uh, we are blessed to be in a room with uh, four gentlemen who made things happen. And by today's standards, many people would just stand around and wonder what happened. And, uh, dynamiting rock basins to uh, make the water deeper. Uh, just let's go dredge up some uh, some mangroves here and make some land. Uh, permitting at the time was, you got the money? Yep. You got the dredge? Yep. Let's go into real estate business. <laughs> that's that's kind of how it was done. Um, and it sounds like Wally put the dirt under your business back in the day, dredging up Island Estates where Ross Yacht stood and uh, where Clearwater Marine Aquarium and Island Way Grill stand today. Used to be good scallop in there. <laughs> I remember as a kid, you know, you know, you'd you see the, the tide was out and the grass was up and the scallops were spitting. I mean, you'd go out there and get a bucket and take home for supper real quick. Yeah, fresh, uh, fresh dinner every night, either with a cast net, a gig, um, a treble hook, yeah, I went across that area uh, that you're talking about where Island the States is between the mangrove islands. And I had my little eight foot cypress skiff with the motor on it like the sailor. You know, you just pick up a scallop and eat it, you know. Take your pen knife and open it and eat it raw. No way anybody's going to starve around here. It was mm -hmm. groves and guavas and mangoes. And, and uh, I, when I walked to school here, 
I lived at 1216 Bay Avenue, where the hospital is now, the Women's Center, to be specific. And they had, they didn't have uh, fences at that time. They had hedges. And they, I walked from my house to school here, and I picked those little, they little bit corrugated, like chairs. Yep. I don't know what the name of them. I didn't have a pit in them. I didn't sort of chairs. Yeah. I'd eat those things, you know, and I'd have red all the <laughs> and the teachers would ask me what I was doing, you know. And what, uh, breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> uh, with Billy, uh, I met Billy in second grade here at South Ward, so I probably know him more than anybody. <laughs> <laughs> you remember when Horton Plant was a wooden two-story? I don't remember being wooden, but um, I, I remember it was tiny. Yeah, I remember I... My mother, I don't know how old I was, my, my father used some explosives, but not to put piling in. Uh, he used it for demolition work when he got into marine construction business. He always had it. That's, that's where I got my start with it. I'd watch him, you know, use primer cord and, uh, and uh, mainly dynamite at the time. Dynamite's not very stable. It's, uh, you leave it set too long, the nitroglycerin starts to run out of the fillers. It's dangerous. And uh, my mother wanted a hibiscus tree taken out of the back. <laughs> I think I'm reading ahead. <laughs> and I, I blew that thing out. You know, I had to use too much powder, and they were throwing pieces of it off the hospital the next day. <laughs> I've never gotten any trouble about that. <laughs> one, of the, one of the neighbors thought I was crazy, you know, and she should have me committed. But uh, that's the, uh, the next door neighbor, you know, he, he came around and I had a fairly good sized hole there and he was nice enough and he did wow it looks like you got a little too much of a charge in that did you Bobby? <laughs> 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 uh, I record when I was working vision in Gulf Harbors in Fort Richard. The <clears throat> I was there kept complaining about their apartment quarters being stolen being stolen out of the shed. So I was walking with the superintendent down the seawall and Stopped and looked. He said, That guy's got his boat tied up with primer cord. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that was stable. You didn't have to worry about it. And, uh, probably if you, got it, if you got it in the water, it wouldn't go off unless you initiate it from a dry end. Then you could, then it would, then it would go off. And very good uh, piece of equipment. You can do an awful lot with it. It's too bad that regulations and so forth are such that uh, you can't use it. Uh, I, I blew a, a uh, propeller off a shrimp boat. The guy gets him. I don't know if you got involved in that or not. But he had a guy yeah, was my cousin. Yeah, well, I know you knew him. I, I didn't know he was your cousin, but I knew you, you and him were very good friends. Anyway, some shrimp boat sunk off the hand clothes, not very far off the hand clothes. He wanted to propel her off of it, and they couldn't get it off. They had the nut off of it, and it was half in the sand. You could just about see the, the, the uh, shaft, or half the shaft, and I, I dug around that so I could get it, and I blew that prop off of it, and then he floated it. It was a pretty big prop. I guess he couldn't pick it up, and the, uh, they lost it on the way in, and I don't know if they ever found it. So there's some more some more lore. Yeah. It was a big uh, big probably a bronze prop at the time, or brass? It was bronze. Bronze prop, somewhere between Anclo Key and the mouth of the, tar the Anclo River. Yeah. So, we'll begin, uh, begin the myth and uh, let them go start looking. Yeah, so. every time after that, uh, any time I towed anything that was sunk, I put a buoy on it in a line. It was like they lose You knew where? I could get it back. <laughs> I could find it again. <laughs> Very, very interesting. Uh, very enjoyable. I uh, appreciate you guys coming in. Anything else that, uh, that you'd like to share with us? Anything comes out of your past? Any other connections to Clearwater? There's probably a lot of them. I just can't think of them right now. We can certainly do this again. And um, we are going to have an exhibit in May. Is it April or May? Our waterfront and fishing exhibit. You know, I can't, I can't it remember. It's co coming up. We've got the women's exhibit coming up next month in March and in either April or May. 
Uh, we've uh, working with the state. There's actually a, a traveling museum that they have, which is dedicated specifically to fishing and the state of Florida. And we are going to encompass that with our local because there's so much additional history here in Clearwater, specifically in Pinellas in general. Uh, case in point with the 4U instrumental in so much of this uh, community-wise and statewide and national and in some cases even international. Um, a neat connection to Clearwater here uh, and uh, we'll be uh, getting invitations to y'all as well when this for our VIP initiation which either takes place previ just previous or upon the opening day because you guys really are the history. We're just preserving it and recording it like we're doing today in today's podcast to share with current and future generations who only heard these stories. You guys wrote them. Well, thank you so much. Uh, appreciate you joining us today. Again, we're uh, just concluding with uh, Bob Bress and Wally Erickson. Uh, stay tuned. Our next podcast will begin here shortly, uh, and it will be with Courtney Ross and his associate, Bill Graham goes by Billy Graham, not that one. This is the real Billy Graham. <laughs> hey, thanks for joining us. Uh, we'll see you soon.